If I had to guess, I would think that data is probably the right place to look for examples of simple applications of Stokes' theorem and differential forms in higher dimensions. So let's think. Let's see what we can come up with. Oh, wait, I remember back in chapter 16 where we started looking at time series and we left a lot of questions unanswered. So let's think about time series. Remember how that worked. Recall that we had a bunch of periodic time series signals. And what we did was we took a pair of them, xi and xj, and looked at the region D that they traced out in the plane. If you integrate the two form dxi wedge dxj, then that tells you about leading or lagging. When that integral was positive, xi leads xj. When it's negative, xj leads xi. But how do we integrate this when our region in the plane is not so simple? When things are kind of complicated, it's sort of hard to make sense of. I think this is where Stokes' theorem is going to be helpful. Instead of trying to work with some complicated region in a plane, let's work directly in n-dimensional space. Okay, so you've got these n signals. Let's consider the two form dxi wedge dxj. Now we've got to integrate that over some sort of two-dimensional region d. Let's call that term a sub ij. Now what Stokes theorem says is that we can replace that with the integral over the boundary of this region of the one form field one half xi dxj minus xj dxi. Do you see how that works? That reminds me of something we did back in chapter 15. Now the cool thing is, is that this works for any two dimensional surface D that bounds that loop gamma given by the parametrized curve from these n time series. And that's pretty significant. What that means is that instead of worrying about uh, what happens when we project to this plane or that plane or the other plane, we simply integrate that one form over the full loop in the n-dimensional space. And computing this is going to give us that term a sub ij that tells us something about whether xi is leading or lagging xj. And in fact, what we can do is compute this for all values of i and j and pop them into a matrix, a lead matrix that summarizes all leading and lagging behavior. That is, that is really cool to think about how you can work in the full n-dimensional space and just integrate these various one-form fields. Now that lead matrix is going to have some interesting structure. Along the diagonal, it's going to be zero. Let's see what happens when you reverse i and j. Oh, that's right. We're going to get an anti-symmetric matrix. That's pretty cool. Okay, but I think that there's a lot more that we can do a lot more that we need to think about. So let's think, why, why are we using Stokes' theorem? Isn't there an easier way to get at this data? Well, I think that Stokes' theorem has some real advantages when working with this data structure. First of all, there's no need for the time series to be exactly periodic as long as the system is cyclic, as long as this curve in the n-dimensional space comes back close to its start point regularly, then that's fine. We can just approximate it with a closed curve and then apply Stokes' theorem, integrate over that curve in n dimensions. Now that might be really useful for data that is not perfectly periodic. Now here's the real killer. Because of how Stokes' theorem works, it's only the path that matters and not how the path is parametrized. This is the wonderful thing about differential forms. That means that we can have data that backtracks or we can have data that is cyclic but not in a uniformly recurring manner. What? What does that mean? Think about something like, oh, the business cycle in economics. Right, things go up and then they come down and then they go up and then they come down, but this does not happen at regular time intervals. It is cyclic data without necessarily being periodic data. That's fine, that just changes the parameterization of the path and we know from the change of variable theorem, boom, we are good to go there. 
Lastly, if you think about time series data in practice, it often does not come as a smoothly time parameterized curve, but rather as discreetly sampled. I get data points as a function of discrete time periods. Well, this method is going to adapt to that really nicely. We can approximate things with a piecewise linear path, and then we can use the methods of chapter 15 to get a combinatorial formula for these integrals. Let's remember how that works. Let's say that you're trying to compute a sub ij, and so you're working with a projected path in the xi, xj plane. Each segment, let's call that gamma superscript k, has a start point and an end point. Now, there's no way to get around the fact that this notation is kind of awful. What, we got xi1k and xj1k and xi2k and xj2k, whatever. Make up your own nicer notation. This is at least consistent with what we've done back in chapter 15. Using those exact same methods, we can parameterize this path, integrate it, add them all up, and we get a combinatorial formula that a sub ij is one half the sum over k xi1k xj2k minus xi2k xj1k. That is so cool. But look, let's keep thinking. There are so many more questions that are raised that are unanswered. I wonder, does this stuff really work? I mean, can you always infer leading or lagging behavior? I've shown you some simple examples where things are kind of obvious, but hey, look, I have not given you a proof. I have not given you careful hypotheses. This is the time for a mathematician to come in and carefully state and prove what can and cannot be done. That is the job of mathematics, to make things precise and careful. But look, there are more questions. This lead matrix kind of reminds me of a covariance matrix. Do you remember those guys? Volume 3, chapter 12. Hmm. I wonder, I wonder if we can, with this lead matrix, do all the same kinds of things that one can do with a covariance matrix. Things like filtering and data analysis, other things. For example, could we take linear combinations of signals? and derive new signals from them that are better or stronger leading or lagging indicators. I wonder if the algebra of this lead matrix winds up being useful. There are so many good questions for you to think about. Indeed, this is not the end. The story of calculus, the story of mathematics is still being written. We still have so much left, not only to learn, but to discover. You have learned so much on this journey through multivariable calculus, but are there more things for you to do? Are there more uses for matrices, for derivatives, for integrals, differential forms, Stokes theorem and the fundamental theorem in data science, in other areas of applications maybe that we haven't even yet discovered. There is so much more for you to learn and for you to do. The story of mathematics is still going on.